This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation-funded project hosted by Northeastern University that promotes public scholarship on religion. I highly recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website, sacred-rights.org, that's W-R-I-T-E-S, or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. The ways in which politics and religion are interconnected in countries around the world is an endless well of cultural history. How religion plays into issues of debates on social issues, regional governance, voting results, and more feels immeasurable and overwhelming when I ponder it carefully. Another issue is considering what happens when religious rituals and national norms and customs are thrown into disarray due to an unforeseen tragedy. How do our norms, customs, and rituals adjust when previously unforeseen events take place? One example of when norms and customs failed was in the aftermath of the 2001 assassination of the Nepali royal family and the story of how Hindu succession rituals fell apart, leading to an upheaval in the Nepali monarchy. My guest on this episode is Dr. Anne Mako, Associate Professor of Asian Religions at Concordia College. She is a specialist in the religions of South Asia and has spent several years living in Nepal, but has also spent time in India, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. She is primarily interested in the ways ritual performance and ritual change can shape collective ideas and ideology. In this episode, we discuss her book, Demoting Vishnu, Ritual, Politics, and the Unraveling of Nepal's Hindu Monarchy. In this conversation, we discuss her interest in Nepal and then do a deep dive on the background of the 2001 Nepalese royal family assassination, the jarring aftermath, and how succession rituals failed, leading to a turning point in the governance of Nepal. You can follow Dr. Ann Mako on Twitter at The Mock Owl, and you can follow me on Twitter at Classical underscore Ideas. Thank you so much for listening. Dr. Ann Mako, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. I am delighted to have you here tonight, Dr. Mako. This is going to be a wonderful conversation. And I'm wondering if you can start off a little bit by introducing yourself to the audience, however you see fit. Of course. Um, I am Associate Professor of Asian Religions at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. I realized I'm beginning my 10th year here on the faculty, which is a little hard to believe. Hmm. I'm a specialist in the religions of South Asia, particularly Hinduism and Jainism. I'm an expert in ritual and Hindu monarchy in modern Nepal. Wonderful. I'm curious about how you found your way into that, because I love learning about how people came to find their areas of expertise. Oftentimes, it's a very purposeful trajectory uh, based on a, one particular experience, and sometimes it's very meandering. So the backstory is always so fascinating. Uh, can you trace a little bit of your academic path and maybe some notable turning points along the way that led you to being an expert in these areas? Yeah, I want to start with um, choosing my study abroad program mm. in college. Wonderful. I had decided that I wanted to fling myself somewhere to the other side of the world and really immerse myself in another culture and learn a language and live with the host family. And it turns out there aren't a ton of programs that will do that. And I, I'd found a few that would, and I came down between Botswana and Nepal Mm. and I said, eeny, meeny, miny, Nepal has Buddhism. So I will go to Nepal. Wonderful. Joke on me being that Nepal is actually a majority Hindu country. Um, (laughs) And um, so I ended up um, in January of 2001, arriving in Nepal, being placed with a host family who was instructed to speak no English with me um, and going to classes each day to learn language and learn culture. And so I'd been having this really intense, immersive experience the whole spring of 2001. And then 
early in the morning, like around dawn on June 2nd, which was supposed to be the last week of my study abroad program, Mm -hmm. the assistant director of my program called my host family. um, And I came to the phone and Prava said, Anne, someone has gotten into the palace and has shot the king and the queen. Don't go anywhere. Mm. And so then I just stumbled into my host parents' bedroom, which is where the television was. And we spent the entire weekend watching a national tragedy unfolding on live television. And we watched, uh, we watched the funerals and the cre- cremations that afternoon. We then uh, spent the entire weekend trying to figure out what was going on. The palace was releasing no information. Mm. Nobody knew what was happening. And then on Monday, there was a new king who uh, received a crown on his head first thing Monday morning. And um, I watched the whole thing play out. And then all of a sudden, I was really interested in monarchy. Mm. And I was really interested in rituals of monarchy in particular. And so when I got back and I was starting my senior year of college, I applied to graduate school. And my idea was that I would research how these really um, ancient, I perceive them as kind of archaic rituals were supporting an otherwise really modernist monarchy. How somebody who drives around in a sedan and a helicopter and wears sunglasses and has a doctor in Switzerland and all of this stuff also does all of this really ancient stuff. Um, and so I was going to write a doctoral dissertation about ancient rituals and modern monarchy. And then in 2006, Nepal had a, a, a revolution. It hmm. had a people's movement. And over the course of 2006 to 2008, they decided to fire the king and they dismantled the monarchy. And this king that I had watched crown on live television, I realized I had watched his entire reign and now I was going to watch him depart the palace also on live television. Wow. And all of the rituals that I was planning on writing my dissertation about all of a sudden turned into the battlegrounds over whether the monarchy would exist in some form after the king had been removed from the government. And the interim government decided to remove the king from those rituals and just totally eliminate monarchy. And so that's what I ended up writing my dissertation about instead, which turned into my first book. But even still, I've even though my main research was on this period of 2006 to 2008 and the, the purposeful dismantling of the monarchy, um, 2001 has always been in the background, right? It was really the, the germ of this. It formed a chapter of the dissertation and then the book. And um, now that it's 20 years later, um, I've been going back and thinking about how foundational this is to my academic journey. And I've started a manuscript that's just about um, the massacre and what happened um, on that really fateful weekend. And so I was really excited to get the opportunity to come and, and talk about that with you. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. So your area of specific interest is extremely tied to a one particular day based on a place in the world that you happen to be simply almost by chance by going one or the other. And you picked one that wound up having this really transformative historical moment. And then that kind of set the stage for everything else, didn't it? Absolutely. Unbelievable. Okay. That is amazing. Well, and I know that you sort of frame your area of primary research interest as the ways that ritual performance and ritual change can shape collective ideas and ideology. And I'd love to know if you can def- like describe that, define that for maybe listeners out there who aren't really sure what these terms, ritual performance or ritual change, what they mean. Sure. Um, I want to I want to take that question in a, a few different directions. Sure. Um, so I want to say first that I'm really interested in knowledge that sits in the body. I think we tend to get really interested in knowledge that's in the brain. Mm-hmm. And as scholars of religion, we often talk about you know belief and faith and kind of brain based things. But I'm always interested in the things that happen in the body. And in part, I think that's because of um, you know my own personal trajectory. I was raised Protestant Christian, um, and I got to a point where I was having this kind of theological crisis: like, do I believe in the incarnation and all of this stuff? But I would go to church on Christmas Eve, and I would hold my candle, and the lights would go down, and everybody would start singing. I would cry, <laughs> and I'm thinking, why is it that I would be so moved commemorating something that I'm not sure that I believe in, mm. and realizing that 
that I had this embodied response and this embodied knowledge. I was really, I was really drawn to trying to figure that out and unpack that and figure out what are the ways that my body was invested in religion um, in ways that my mind necessarily wasn't. And that's something that Christianity couldn't explain to me, mm. but it turns out that Hinduism really could. Mm. Um, Hinduism is an orthopraxic religion rather than orthodoxic, which is to say it says practice matters more. Um, if you maintain your um, your practice obligations, your ritual obligations within the family, within the community, if you follow certain holidays, it really doesn't matter what you think about them. Mm-hmm. That what really matters is what you do. Um, and as I got to understand Hinduism, that really kind of explained me back to myself in a way that I found really compelling. Yeah. Um, and then um, a second thread I'd like to pull is the way that I was initially framing my PhD work. So I was saying that when I was getting ready to start grad school, I wanted to do this project on like archaic rituals and modern monarchy. And I eventually realized that I'd fallen into kind of a common American trap of thinking of ritual as something that really belongs to the past, Mm -hmm. something that is old and time bound and changeless and that modern people just throw off. And it occurred to me at some point that Nepalis live in the exact same time that I do. They are <laughs> modern humans and that they are living their lives and living their traditions in ways that are creative and contemporary. And so I also, at a certain point, needed to account for how Nepalis could be um, responsive to the past without thinking of them as being stuck in it in some way. And so some of being interested in ritual is also trying to um, dismantle that that sort of default exoticism and orientalism that I carried in um, before I started really studying this. Mm. A third thread I wanted to pull on um, as I was sort of doing my, my work on this project, it started to occur to me that one of the things that ritual does is that ritual performs realities in kind of stylized ways. So it takes the messy world and it presents it as if it's clear. And in doing this, it can kind of rubber stamp things. It stamps certain things as being true. And it does it in a way that's really hard to argue with. And so one of the things that I really want to put forward in my work about Nepali royal ritual is that rituals are arguments. They are arguments about the world and um, they can create realities and they can take messy realities and clarify them. And so, for example, if you take the ritual of a wedding, you have two people who've had some kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're deeply in love. Maybe they just met each other. Maybe He's marrying her for her money. (laughs) Who knows what it is? But in the course of this ritual, they are presented as um, two individuals that come together and they create a couple and it creates a new kinship bond and they walk out as a a kind of new social unit. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the ritual has taken the messy world and said, this is how this works. Um, And so it has made an argument about the people who were involved And one of the things that I started to notice was that if you change rituals, you change the arguments that the rituals are putting forward. Mm. And so you change what you are arguing to be true about the world. And so if we return to the the wedding piece, um, if you have a really long tradition of taking um, somebody who presents as male and somebody who presents as female and stamping them as a married couple. And then you start having two women who come together as brides or two men who come together as brides or multiple people who come together as a polyamorous unit and you stamp Mm -hmm. them as being a family unit. You have radically changed what you are arguing to be true about the world. Mm. You're not just kind of reflecting what somebody believes somewhere else, you are not uh, reproducing the past seamlessly, you are, um, you are making an argument about the world. Um, and so one of my fairly early publications was actually about uh, the tradition in San Francisco of performing Columbus's expedition every Columbus Day, mm. that you would have local citizens land in a boat to discover San Francisco. <laughs> 
and how <laughs> starting in the 1970s, you started having native activists disrupting this mm -hmm. and that you needed to interrupt the ritual to make a new kind of argument about about history and about who we are as contemporary people. And so I really got interested in the ways that ritual change works and how um, modifying rituals or how accidentally newly performed rituals change the meaning that happens. I never thought about it like that as well, like changing it into an, thinking about it as an argument when you change the way a ritual is done, how you're arguing that a new reality should exist. I've never thought about it like that, but that's something that we all do all the time whenever, if we're actually reflective about the ways that societies can be different moving forward is we are making new arguments by modifying the past, like the, the things that we've inherited. Wow. I'm having a real epiphany moment here in real time. I love that. Um, but, you know, you mentioned orthopraxy as well. And that's something that my students always really appreciated about Hinduism when I were, we would t like learn about those and have like our guest speakers come in and talk about the ways that they have different relationships with God or gods, like the different um, versions um, that, that people practice, like based on choice. And that was a really fascinating thing. Did you have a hard time like kind of wrapping your brain around that whenever you were, when you went to Nepal and you started realizing the ways that people live their lives in other countries around the world? Yes. Um, and one thing that I, I noticed was that basically everybody that I knew who'd been raised in a religious background in my early 20s, mid 20s, was having some kind of crisis in how they related to their religious traditions mm -hmm. and how, if at all, they wanted to continue to engage. Was there room for them? Did they feel comfortable? And I discovered that basically zero Hindus that I met felt that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that um, one of the things that seems to me to be a real advantage of putting emphasis on practice is that it doesn't feel invasive it's kind of flexible and you can you can participate in a practice and be really into it it can be deeply meaningful and that's great or you can kind of go through the motions and it's kind of fine and it works either way and i think about that say with graduations now that i'm college faculty we go to a lot of graduations and they're really really boring but my own graduation was really meaningful to me and the graduations work no matter whether you are excited and teary or bored out of your mind. Mm -hmm. The process of getting together and sitting down um, marks a reality in a particular way. And so I think that putting the focus on how you act um, frees you up to have a more flexible relationship with your tradition in a lot of ways, which is really counterintuitive because most Americans, I think, consider being committed to ritual to be to be constraining, mm. right? And you, you hear a lot of people talking about, oh, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And the idea is that religion and formal practice is constraining. And I find on the contrary that Hindus tend to find it really freeing. Amazing. I love that uh, because I've, I've noticed that as well with some of my friends who identify as Hindu. And they so, so many of the things that I was worried about growing up, they didn't have those same concerns. So I actually have similar experiences within my own friendships. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so when you came back from Nepal, from this extremely like chance encounter that brought you to Nepal, and then you had this very transformative moment while in Nepal with the tragedy and the massacre of the royal family, did you come back knowing that your future had Nepal involved in it, like with your future academic work? Was this a certainty or was this something that you kind of had to figure out along the way and kept coming back to? No, it didn't feel like a certainty. It felt like this yawning, gaping injury and mystery. Mm. It really, it just was that I'd been through this experience that I did not understand. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the whole thing, right? I spent all of that study abroad semester totally disoriented, you know, learning learning how to talk again, learning how to eat, learning how to dress myself and like, use a Nepali bathroom. And then this, you know, the world just fell apart all of yeah. a sudden. And so um, what I was carrying out of it was this, um, this huge 
need to find ways to explain to myself what what had happened. And of course, I might note, you, I don't know if you put together, but June 1st, 2001, when the royal family was killed, is a mere three months before September 11th, I was just 2001. thinking that. Ju- I was just thinking that. So I got back to the United States, and then the United States has this whole national tragedy, and I was like, oh, I just did this. Okay, here oh, we boy. go again. <laughs> um, but no, I, I came into grad school... Um, not really with a mission so much as a well of questions and uh, kind of vague impulses that there was something really interesting there, but I didn't have language for it yet. And so I went to grad school to try to achieve the language for myself. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Where did you wind up? Who was your, who was your mentors through this grad school program? Um, I went to the University of Chicago Divinity School. Nice. And I ended up kind of working jointly with the whole history of religions faculty. So I worked with Christian Wittemeyer as my advisor and then Bruce Lincoln, who's, of course, all about power and authority and politics and religion. And so he was really foundational to me. And then also Wendy Doniger as an expert in South Asia. Well, your your work led to, as you mentioned earlier, a book called Demoting Vishnu, Ritual Politics and the Unraveling of Nepal's Hindu Monarchy, which is about succession rituals. And I'm wondering if you can, you know, tell me about like the the like the genesis of the book, um, because then I want to talk a little bit more about the specifics of the royal family. Sure. Yeah. So um, so the book is really about how ritual was part of the long term collapse of the Nepali monarchy. So um, it gives an introductory chapter about ritual itself and what I think ritual can do. And then it gives a just history of monarchy in Nepal. Then it has a chapter on succession rituals. And then it has three chapters about what I call reinforcement rituals, which after you've placed somebody in the position of King of Nepal, then you put them out in public on a routine basis to keep reinforcing that role socially. And so in fact, in 2006 to 2008, what the interim government went after were the reinforcement rituals. Mm. And so that portion of the book is really about the process of deleting the king out of all of these other rituals. But I think that it's, the stage is really set for that by the fact that the institution of monarchy itself gets weakened in 2001 because the succession rituals don't successfully hand off kingship to from from one king to the next. So one of the one of the things that I think is really interesting that you see by looking at kingship is the way that ritual can assign identities to people. When you have something like king of Nepal, you have this idea, you have this social identity and you need to be able to hand it off from one person to another. And so there end up being eventually 13 kings in the Shah dynasty. And so as soon as one king dies, you need to pass that role to somebody new. And you need to do it preferably as, as smoothly and quickly as you can, like a magician doing a sleight of hand trick, right? You need to pass the ball from one hand to the other with nobody noticing. Mm. And so you can see this in a lot of different processes where you have a transmittable social identity, like the American president, for example, we have a long process of trying to identify the person. We have campaigning and we have an election, but then we have a ritual. We have an inauguration. And the moment of the inauguration is the point where the role president of the United States is handed from one person to another person. And so in the case of kingship, um, one of the things that's that's strange is that this usually happens when a king dies. Right? Mm-hmm. The, the advantage of a presidential system is that you have a calendar when this is supposed to happen. Right. And so it regularizes that handoff. But in the case of a king, one king is supposed to be king for the rest of his life. And you don't know exactly when the king is going to die and you need to change gears all of a sudden. And so you need a fairly elaborate ritual apparatus that can be put into action kind of almost immediately right. to, to lift that identity off the king who has died and place it instead onto the person who is going to succeed him. And so that's the process where ritual does work of kind of stitching together individuals into this unbroken idea, King of Nepal. And so in 2001, when the royal family gets shot, um, the succession rituals can't do it. They can't manage this particular situation. They can't switch the ball from one hand to another without dropping it. 
they can't lift the identity from one king and put it onto another in a way that feels compelling to people. And so even though everybody does the ritual, does the right rituals in the right way, the process overall really fails. Mm. And that means that the institution itself, the idea king of Nepal, kind of undergoes damage in that moment. Wow. Okay. This is really, I mean, we'll get to this too. We're going to, I want to explain, examine the exact ways that it fails. But before we do that, something that I'm curious about is we know that on June 1st, 2001, this massacre of the royal family occurs. And we know that from 2006 to 2008, the monarchy collapses essentially. But what about before that? I'm wondering about like the history of Nepalese monarchy and if there's anything that you would like to do to kind of fill in for the audience a little bit about the history of this institution, which ends in 2008. What is before all of that? What's really interesting to me is the way that the history of Nepal and the history of Shah dynasty kings end up being really tightly bound together. So Nepal doesn't exist as a unified territory until pretty recently. Up until the 1700s, the Himalayan region was pretty politically fragmented. There were small scale city states. So the city of Kathmandu had its own king for many centuries. There were a few valleys that would be consolidated under a local king, a few relatively short-lived um, empires. But there was not one territory stretching across all of the Himalayan foothills like you have now. And then in the mid-1700s, which is the time period when the British are starting to encroach into what is now India, you get a king in the Himalayan foothills named Prithvi Narayan Shah, who comes to the throne in the small city of Gorkha. And he starts to take notes from the British on military strategy, and he's supposed to buy weapons from the British. And he uses these to take over a huge swath of territory. And one of the things that's really neat is that he and his descendants end up being able to fend off British imperial incursions. The British do attempt to colonize the Himalayan foothills, and the Gorkhalis fight them off. The British um, have to leave. They, they um, concede defeat to the Nepalis, and Nepal remains one of the very few places in South or Southeast Asia that remains independent from colonization through the entire colonial period. President Narayan Shah's most important conquest is his conquest of the Kathmandu Valley in the 1760s. He moves his capital there and he has himself recrowned as the king of a united Nepal. And that happens in 1768. 1768, not accidentally, then gets used as the date of the founding of modern Nepal. So the date that the Shah king had himself crowned in his new capital becomes the date of the starting of the country itself. Then Prithvi Narayan Shah and his descendants continue to rule United Nepal from 1768 until 2008, when the monarchy is dissolved and King Ganander leaves the palace. We have 240 years where we have a country that is united under one particular dynasty. It's interesting to note, though, that just because there's a Shah king at the head of the country, that doesn't mean that the Shah King's role is always the same. And in fact, there ends up being a big ebb and flow in the Shah King's roles in the government. Sometimes he's really running the direct administration of the state, but a lot of the time he's serving as a figurehead. In particular, for basically all of the 1800s and the first half of the 1900s, from 1900 until 1950, The king is functionally out of power. There are regents and prime ministers and hereditary prime ministers who are running the government in the king's name. But basically, the king himself is having no day-to-day participation in the government. Then in 1950, King Tribuvan, who is King Durandra's grandfather, throws his lot in with a pro-democracy movement. And he ends up claiming power at the head of the government and kicking out the hereditary prime ministers, the Rana family. And from that point through the rest of the 20th century, the Shah kings are considerably more powerful as political figures than they've been in earlier generations. And they are basing that power on their claimed roles as being defenders of democracy and promoters of development and modernization. 
And so Hindu monarchy in Nepal isn't really this kind of ancient archaic thing that somehow survives into the modern period, but rather the Shah kings spend the 20th century arguing that they are themselves fundamentally modern um, and that they are leading a fundamentally modernizing nation. But so the political roles of the Shah kings really vary through time. But what doesn't vary that much is their ritual roles. They will perform the same ritual political functions year after year, generation after generation. And the king's social identity ends up being held stable through ritual, even as his practical power fluctuates. Whether the king is attending cabinet meetings or just sitting around in the palace, he always goes to Indra Jatra. He always goes to Bhoto Jatra. He will always have come to power through the same kinds of succession rituals. Um, and so when it comes time in 2008 to dismantle the monarchy, the interim government goes after the set of rituals that had been constructing the royal identity. But if we want to backtrack and be thinking specifically about what happens in 2001, when the royal family gets killed, the thing that's most important to know is that at this point in history, in 2001, King Barendra has been king for almost 30 years. He had come to the throne in 1972. And so he has been leading the country and anchoring the idea of the Nepali state for most of living memory. There are whole generations of people who cannot remember before Barendra was king. There will be some people who might have tie, uh, ties and memories of Barendra's father. There will be a handful of people who might remember back to Barendra's grandfather. But Barendra's grandfather died in 1955. And so King Barendra is really just part of the backdrop of being Nepali, as is the presence of his wife, Queen Ashoria, and their son, Crown Prince Dipendra. They are the the symbols of the Nepali state. And so it's really hard to overstate the degree to which the shootings on June 1st, 2001 end up upending Nepali people's baseline understanding of what their country is like. It fundamentally disrupts the imagining of the nation. And so then when Birendra is killed, the throne very briefly passes to his eldest son, the crown prince, but the problem is that the crown prince has been shot in the same event that his father died. And so he only lives from Friday night to Sunday, into Mon Sunday night into Monday morning. And then he dies without having ever regained consciousness. And so he's been king for two days, but he's not known that he was king. Nobody's been able to put a crown on his head or seat him on a throne or do any of the things that would meaningfully craft him as the king of Nepal. Um, and then when he dies, King Birendra's younger brother, Ganendra, who was not in Kathmandu at the time of the shooting, um, becomes king because he is next in line to the throne. And the palace seems to have thought that that was enough, right? You just follow the line of succession. The person who's next on the list becomes king Everybody knows that's how it works. And don't seem to have realized how jarring this was to people and how much nobody in the world, probably including the new king himself, ever expected him to become king. Right? This is something really, really fundamentally um, kind of an earthquake in Nepali politics. It's restructuring the state around a totally new person that nobody ever expected to have as king. Um, and so he kind of becomes king, but not in a way that people find super compelling. And um, then he ends up taking direct control of the government in 2005. Everybody's really grumpy. So then there's a revolution in 2006. And in 2008, there's a national election. And the first um, gesture of the new parliament is to legally dissolve monarchy. They write him a letter. They say, please leave the palace. He says, OK. And he goes back to his private residence where he lived up until 2001 when he became king, which is only about a mile from the palace. And so one of the things that's really interesting is that um, there was this really radical regime change that was totally peaceful. Um, and he still lives in Nepal and he still wow. he goes out in public periodically and he still lives down the street from the palace. And he's just the guy who used to be the king of Nepal. Oh, my gosh. That is amazing. What a story. That was really well said, by the way. Um, I'm curious about who else 
so we we know that the that King Berenger died. We know the Crown Prince died. I know there were more deaths as well, right? Who else was there? Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was the the tradition in the Shaw family to get together once a week or sorry, once a month as the extended family to have dinner together at one of their private residences. And so on the night of June 1st, um, there were 25 people who came, 14 of them got shot, 10 of them died. Wow. King Berendra's entire immediate family died. So that was King Berendra, his wife, Queen Aishwarya, all three of their children. So that would be the crown prince, their daughter, Shruti, and the junior son, Mirajan. And then basically all of King Birendra's generation also died. So um, his brother who was there, um, his sisters-in-law, his sisters, his, um, let's see, his cousin, two of his cousins were shot. Um, and so there's, um, there's a sort of real bloodbath and um, the, the eldest members of the party and the youngest members of the party all survived. And so, um, the, the immediate family died and then the king's generation died and then there were some survivors on the other side. Do, what do we know about the assailant or assailants? I'm curious about who has carried this out, what we know, what we don't know. So on the morning of June 2nd, the, the news that was leaking out was that it was the crown prince who had shot everyone. Now, this was being widely reported in the Indian media and the American and international media. And eventually the, the investigation committee confirmed this to have been the case. The Nepali government didn't want to say anything. So over that weekend, Ganendra, who became king at the end of everything, he got on national television and he said, there was a dinner party and there was a weapon and it went off akasmat, which means out of the sky, like accidentally. <laughs> and it just killed 10 people. Oh my gosh. Um, so everybody was like, um, clearly you're lying to us. And so Nepalis uniformly believe that not to have been true. I'm inclined to think that it is true. Um, so I'm inclined to think that what happened was the crown prince started off initially intending to assassinate his father. But then what all of the eyewitness accounts say is that he came in to the party in combat fatigues, carrying weapons, and he shot his father, and then he left the room. And then it was only after he came back that he started shooting everybody else. And what was clear is that King Berender did not immediately die. He died mm. on his way to the hospital. And so when the crown prince came back into the room, his father was on the floor bleeding and still talking. And so my own hypothesis is that the plan was kill dad, become king. And he came back in to announce, hey, everybody, I'm the king of Nepal now. And dad wasn't dead. Mm. And the plan just went off the rails from there. Um, but but Nepalis tend to think that um, it was some kind of um, conspiracy, that it was outside actors. Um, and, and a lot of it is that there's just such profound mistrust of the official narrative because of how badly the palace handled the situation and how little information they gave for so long after it happened. Wow. What was the the scene on the streets like in the days after the massacre? Like, was there widespread uh, unrest in the streets in the city or anything like that? What was it like on the ground? Emotions were running really high. Um, yeah. yeah, people were devastated. They were angry. Um, people were um, flocking by the thousands to come view the funeral processions. Um, People were sobbing. People started throwing rocks at the prime minister during um, that funeral procession. Um, there were riots in a few places. There were demonstrations in front of the palace. Um, there were some people shot by, by police and security forces trying to keep order. Um, on Monday, which is to say the day that 
new King Janendra got crowned the new King of Nepal. Um, there was a shoot on site curfew placed on the entire capital um, for basically the entire day. And mm. um, it just, um, it was, it was scary and devastating and entirely understandable. My goodness. Um, so then I'm wondering about the the transfer of power from Barendra, who was killed, to Ganendra. And you we've talked a little about succession rituals in the former Nepali monarchy or something that, you know, this is something I don't really know much about. And we talked a little bit about what ritual looks like. And I'm wondering about how Hinduism comes into these rituals and what the actual transfer of power to Ganendra looked like, because uh I know that it doesn't go right and I know that it ultimately fails. So I'm wondering what that process looked like and then why it doesn't work. Yeah, (laughs) it's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, So let me start with the, how is this a set of Hindu rituals? Sure. So the first piece is that in, in trying to lift off the identity King of Nepal from the old King, that's, done in in the Nepali case, as in most monarchies case, through the funeral of the old king. What's unique about Hindu funerals is they are really elaborate and long, but also they start really immediately. So because Hindu traditions are really concerned about ritual purity, you can't let a body start to putrefy. Mm. If the body starts to putrefy, it becomes a ritual purity disaster, basically, that, that you want... You want to um, resolve the remains, the physical remains, as fast as you can while the body is still um, whole and intact as best as possible. And so the ideal is to try to cremate the body within 24 hours. And then after the cremation, then you have a very elaborate further set of rituals. And so um, there's a basically two week long process that is called Kriya, and that involves usually the the son of the person who has died doing a really elaborate set of rituals to essentially help the soul on its journey into its next existence. Um, And so they are um, doing readings and they're making offerings and they'll shave their heads and wear white and they'll stay in a really confined place that's reserved for them to, to take on this really weighty ritual responsibility. And then at the end of that, that Kriya period, you have a kind of release from the deepest ritual impurity for the household where the death has happened. But then you still have observances at the 30-day mark, the 45, 60, 90-day mark, then six months and one year. And then you will continue to commemorate that person on their anniversary of death for some number of years until eventually they get kind of folded into ancestors. And so one of the things that is that goes wrong in trying to hold a funeral for King Brendra is that he doesn't have a son to do his cremation or mm-hmm. his kriya rituals for him. When Brendra's father, Mahendra, had died, King Brendra couldn't do it himself because he just became king, but he had two younger brothers. And so his two younger brothers went off and they did all of the rituals for, for their father. And when King Brendra died, one of his sons was in a coma and the other son was two cremation pyres over being burned at the same time with a surgical bandage holding the back of his head in place for the purposes of the television cameras. Yeah. And so um, there was this sort of deep way in which the, um, the disruption of the whole family gets, gets dramatized here. But the other thing that's really damaging about the funerals is that they happen really fast, right? You have to start the cremation within 24 hours everybody dies at a dinner party at about nine o'clock the night before. So you need to cremate them the following night, Saturday night. Everybody in the country has just woken up Saturday morning to the news that the Royal family has died. The palace isn't saying anything for hours and hours and hours. If you turn on the national television, it's just a picture of Pashupatinath temple and some devotional music playing on loop. Wow. What is happening? (laughs) And they finally come say, Oh, the King is dead. And then they, within an hour or two, start the live feed of the funeral. Wow. And so nobody has had a chance to process what is happening. 
And so to go back to my idea that I mentioned earlier about how ritual can stamp certain things as being true, can take a kind of messy narrative and be like, this is what is true. It helps a lot if everybody knows in advance what that narrative is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? If you've had some time, you know, if if you knew that the king was ailing and then he died of heart failure, you knew that that was coming. But the king got shot. You need a lot more time to process that. And so doing things on the regular schedule, it's obvious why people would do that, right? That's the normal plan. And it's really radically the wrong thing. It, is, it further disorients people. It feels like we're stamping, we're like charging forward with what's true about the situation before anybody has grasped any of the details. Um, and then for, for the other piece of that, right? The, um, so you have to lift the, the, the kingship off the old king and then you need to place it on the new king. And the Nepali ritual for doing this involved bringing the new king to a stone uh, coronation platform that had been used all the way back to Prasvina Narayan Shah in the 1760s and to the local kings of Nepal before then. And you place him on a throne and the back of the throne is a golden twined uh, version of Shesha, which is the, the snake vehicle of Vishnu. And so we identify the new king with the iconography of Vishnu and place the really distinctive crown of Nepal on his head. And then all of the representatives of the government come up and they fold their hands and they bow in front of him and place a coin at his feet. So that's not as explicitly Hindu as the funeral rituals, but it's not not Hindu either. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a relatively straightforward thing. But this also really doesn't work in 2001. And it doesn't work on two different levels. <laughs> the first level <laughs> is that we had a king for two days who was in a coma. Right. Right. <laughs> And so we had a whole king that we didn't get to do the ritual for. Mm. And so we should have done the funeral for King Barendra and then crowned his son to create the new kingship. But instead, we just had two days of everybody sitting around while the new king is on life support. And then he dies. And then we're going to place on the throne the king's brother. How did that happen? Um, and so we're crowning the wrong person mm. um, or we're crowning, we're crowning somebody having missed a step, right? So we, we dropped the ball a little bit by not being able to crown the, the comatose king. And now we're just going to try to pass the kingship straight from Durendra to his brother, but everybody's really uncomfortable about that. And the other thing that kind of goes wrong is the pageantry is off. Um, in fact, I think looking back that what had happened was everybody was absolutely exhausted. Everybody who was involved in the tragedy had spent the entire weekend at the hospital, running back and forth to the palace. Nobody was sleeping. Nobody was eating. King Ganendra, new King Ganendra, looks like a mess. He comes <laughs> in. He's, he's also kind of got resting grumpy face. Um, so yeah, he already is like not a super photogenic guy, but yeah. he also just, he's sad and exhausted and he yeah. comes up and he sits on his throne and he slumps and he looks somewhere between bored and irritated and the representatives of the government come up to place their coins at his feet. And most of the time he only gets his hands halfway up to give kind of the prayer hands in response. and a lot of Nepalis were really put off by that. Ooh. Um, that it just, it didn't have the dignity, it didn't have the pageantry to lift things up out of this disastrous situation. So it's something that probably would have flown if everything else was fine, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a, a new king who's not really playing well for the cameras, but everything else is in order, that works. But if everything is in crisis mode, right? It's a problem. King Barendra was really good at being king. He was really cheerful and really gentle and everybody loved him. And everybody's like, oh, and we're going to get this guy. And they didn't believe in it, right? They didn't believe they in didn't him. They didn't believe in it. Yeah. Um, 
it really, it, it took almost no time at all for people to be saying, well, you know how you solve a murder is you ask who benefited. And so clearly the guy who lands up on the throne is responsible for the mass murder. Mm. And so for his entire reign, um, there are these accusations flying around that, that Ganendra planned, um, planned the massacre in order to become king himself. My goodness. Well, you know, and something else that you write about in the book that I found really interesting is the ways is the term ritual infelicities, which I believe is uh, a a Ronald Grimes term. Is that correct? It is. Yes. So um, this is the ways that these uh, rituals have failed during this transmission. And you have a couple of categorizations of ritual infelicities that I'm wondering about some examples of. So you have gloss, flop and defeat. And I'm wondering a little bit about each of these key terms because they've never come up on the show before. And I'm always really interested to get a little bit of new vocabulary uh, documented for the show. So I love this. Uh, he has several others which um, are really useful. Basically, he, he has this essay where he's trying to say, what are the different ways that a ritual can go wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, and the ones that I thought really particularly applied to this case, glossing is where a ritual is trying to paper over a situation that everybody knows about. And so it's trying to kind of pretend that nothing is wrong when in (laughs) fact many things are wrong. And so really this whole situation is one big ritual gloss, right? Like we're going to do all the rituals and pretend everything is fine. Oh my God, all of the royal family is dead. Um, And so, um, but everybody knows that it's not working, right? Everybody can see evidence of the violence. Everybody can see that there are five royal bodies all being cremated at once. This is not a thing that ever happens. Um, and so the rituals can't really make it right when the situation is that much of a problem. Um, a flop is just when, when the ritual itself just kind of doesn't fly for reasons that are internal to the ritual. So the gloss is when the ritual is fine, but it's mismatched to the situation. Um, but a gloss or no, a flop is when, um, the ritual is misperformed in some way. Um, and so in particular, uh, King Ganendra not raising his hands well sure. is an example of flopping, right? That he right. just, the performance isn't something that people find good as an example of this particular ritual. So like the mood during the proceedings can be bad. Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, if, if, if a priest shows up drunk or sure. if somebody wanders through and knocks over the bowl of sacred flowers yeah. <laughs> you can you can just screw the ritual up yeah um and so so that's important also and what about defeat um defeat is where um a ritual in some way works at cross purposes to um potentially other rituals or to, to other things that are going on um and so the ritual is intended to do something. So, so Grimes talks about that a ritual is supposed to accomplish certain things with regard to somebody's goals. Um, and so in, in a situation where you have defeat, you have uh, the ritual bumping up against something else and it can't do its job. And so one of the examples um, I think is that um, we end up having a ritual for um, Dipendra, the crown prince, that is on the 13th day um, or the 11th day, sorry, after his death, that's supposed to mark him and his kingship and send him off and honor him. And they managed to hold that ritual on the same day that the massacre investigation committee puts out their report saying he shot everybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so the ritual honoring him as the king of Nepal for the whole two days that he was king of Nepal gets defeated by the fact that he's also being named by representatives of the government as a mass murderer. And so um, the ritual ends up unable to help create or resolve his kingship in any meaningful way. Gotcha. So I know that Ganendra never really becomes king. Is that just because of the mood surrounding the failings of the of the succession rituals and like the people don't believe in it? Like, is that where the failure comes into play and why he's never really considered to be actual king? That's a lot of it. I also think, you know, some of it is that that everybody's been accustomed to Crown Prince Dependra being the next king of Nepal for a really, really long time. And so um, in addition to just things going wrong with the transmission to Ganendra, 
the fact that Dependers just pulled out of the middle of this um, really throws people for a loop. That Ganendra was never prepped in anybody's minds as being a future king. And so this moment where he's actually becoming the king is his only opportunity to launch his kingliness. And you, they, it's not enough, you know, um, it would have been really hard to place a well-groomed crown prince into office under these circumstances. To put somebody random from the junior line of the family in, it's, it's really kind of disastrous. Um, but then also, um, he's just unpopular. He's, um, he's not got a, a terribly positive reputation going into this. People don't like the way that he conducts himself. He surrounds himself with a lot of um, really uh, conservative politicians from like the 60s. And people are thinking, oh, he really wants to take the country backwards from our democracy movement in 1990. And um, so there, there are a lot of ways that Ganendra doesn't help the situation once he becomes king. Um, and so it's not just that the rituals fail, but it's also not, not that the rituals fail. The rituals failing really meaningfully prevent Ganendra from getting launched in his new position, from really taking on in a compelling way his new social identity as king of Nepal. So fascinating. Did the mood in the country shift in a positive direction after the the dissolution of the monarchy does the mood in the country improve generally for the people it really did there was a huge amount of optimism in 2008 that carried into 2009 2010 and then the new government continued to be just as dysfunctional and just as poor at delivering routine goods and services to the people as any previous government and so um, there's just, there's really been kind of a resurgence in Ganendra's popularity recently, just because everybody hates the people who are actually in power. And they're like, well, that guy seems fine. I don't know. <laughs> there's just so much cynicism and just Nepalis routinely want whoever is not currently running the government. Um, and it's, it's, it's a shame that such an amazing country and such amazing people get such poor governance. Yeah. Well, and I know that you're working really closely with uh, Sacred Rights, the public scholarship um, organization that you're a part of the current research cohort. And, you know, obviously you love your your topic of, of expertise so much that I'm delighted that you're a part of this because it means that you're moving your scholarship into the realm of writing about this broadly for wide readerships. And I'm wondering how that's going and how you can feel uh, how you're like how you're feeling about your new skill sets and things like that that you've gained from being a part of this organization. It's really great. I actually, I came into sacred rights feeling like to do public scholarship, I needed to apply my scholarly skills to new topics. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten in the habit of thinking of this project that you know, I love so much and I put so much work into as being kind of too esoteric for most people to really be that interested in. And so I have another project that I'm working on that is really designed to be for a very public audience. And um, I've been like, oh, I could write an op-ed about this thing or that thing. And really what I've come around to is, no, I could really talk about this. Um, and so um, I, I actually, I, in approaching this podcast episode, I, I was like, I could talk about my project that's public facing, or I could try to talk about the not public facing one and see if I can do it. And I'm really excited that, that you've kind of helped guide me through talking about this in a way that I hope people will find uh, accessible. It's such a gripping story. I mean, it's a piece of history. And you think about Nepal and in the United States uh, imagination of the population here, what we know is Mount Everest and things like that. You know what I mean? We have this very particular view of this one particular place on this one particular piece of the planet. And this is such a rich part of the story of that country that um, I think that this is a story that anybody would be fascinated and, you know, enraptured to listen to just like I have been. So I'm hoping that it's, I'm hoping that it landed just as well for everybody listening as it does for me, you know? 
And I think it's really important to claim Nepal as being not exotic. I mean, it is really different and wonderful in many, many ways, but I think there is a tendency to think of it as being Shangri-La and that, you know, the Pali's who live there must be kind of magical elf beings up in the mountains. Um, but you know, Nepalis are really practical. They're really um, savvy about power and about politics. And I've learned so much from Nepalis about navigating the world and not because they're spiritual, but because um, they are interesting humans who are really culturally different from me. And so I think it's important as a scholar of religion to go to Nepal, not to experience spirituality in the high Himalayas, but to, to look at the ways that uh, ritual can do real political work and to be a force in really kind of recognizably modern and international politics. What are some of your goals for future public scholarship projects? Um, so I, I do have a, a piece coming out um, in December in the Revealer that's going to be about King Ganendra. Love the Revealer. Ganendra. And um, it's going to be about the fact that ex-King Ganendra went to Kumbh Mela in India this spring and caught COVID while he was there. Holy smokes. Did he recover? Um, he did. Uh, okay. He and his wife are, are recuperating now. They both spent multiple weeks in the hospital, um, but they're they are doing fine now. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then I do have, um, as I said, I have a, a separate project going that is um, looking at, at Jainism and Jain daily practices in India as a resource for thinking better about environmentalism. And I think that also comes back to my idea that, that we know the world through our bodies and the ways that we interact with the world in stylized embodied ways really matters and ways that Jains uh, attend to the world is really fascinating. And so um, that is that is also designed to be a, a piece of, of public scholarship. Well, I will definitely have you back to talk about that book that you're working on with regards to Jainism and the environment, because those are topics that I care deeply about as well. So we'll definitely have to do a part two. But in the meantime, Dr. Ann Mako, where can people find you if they want to know more about your work and what you do? Um, they can find me on Twitter. I am at the mock owl. So Mako becomes mock owl. Yeah. Um, there's also a, an open access journal article that, um, that I wrote in the journal Himalaya. That's about what happens to Royal animals after the monarchy. Ends. Whoa, and um, cool. so that has some good pictures and, and that's written with, with my friend Shauna Barnhart. So fabulous. Well, thank you so much for spending this hour with me to talk about your work. It's just been such a thrill. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Great.